thing that you would have us to hear. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Matt, Ryan. Man, that was sweet, wasn't it? Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother John, choir, praise team, and orchestra. Thank you, Children's Church, for joining us. Y'all have fun now. <laughs> All right, if you have your Bibles, would you open with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 13? Amen. John chapter 13, verse 12 through 17. Uh, as you're turning there, I want to encourage you men uh, today at 5 o'clock to be here. Bring a chair, bring a Bible, a notebook, a pen, and a uh, bottle of water perhaps. We're going to meet outside, out back. Uh, won't be uh, long. I know it's going to be warm, but uh, we'll try to find a shady spot. Uh, but come, we're going to open the Word of God as men, and we're going to continue on this journey uh, just trying to challenge each other to become what God wants us to be. So this afternoon at 5 o'clock, you be here. We've been in this Man Challenge series for several weeks now, and I bring you the last message in that today entitled Service Required. We've been talking about what is required to be godly men that God wants us to be, to be leaders in our, of our own hearts, leaders in our home, leaders in our church, leaders in our community. And so I want us to look today uh, at the last part of a very familiar passage. John 13 is well known for the foot washing of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we have actually talked about that in recent days. But I want us to focus on the last few verses where Jesus has already finished that act. And in John 13, verse 12, he says, the Bible says, So when he, that's Jesus, had finished washing their feet, taking his garments and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. For if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I've done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. As we look this morning at this passage and we're talking about, we've looked at so many things that God says are necessary for us as men to become all that he means for us to be. We've talked about leadership required. Uh, we've talked about obedience required, right? We want to talk today about service required. And Jesus gave the ultimate picture and example of servanthood in John 13. And when he finishes, he gets up and he says, do you know what I've just done? And here's what he's saying. What I've just given you a demonstration of is very important. And you need to make sure you don't misunderstand it, misrepresent it. Make sure you don't miss it completely. You need to make sure that you understand what I have just tried to teach you, not just in word, but in actually doing it before you. And so he's not just speaking to his disciples, though he was. He's also speaking to all of us, and especially those of us as men, because just think about it. He is about to leave the world. He is about to die and rise again and ascend back to the Father, right? And so he's about to entrust the message of the kingdom to these men. And he said, I want to make sure you get it because you're going to be the ones to carry it on. And, and by the way, by extension, guys, he's saying to us, because we are to be his ministers, he's saying to us, I want to make sure you get it. And so as we look at this text today, I want you to see four things about this service required. Notice, number one, that servanthood acknowledges the lordship of Christ. Let me say that again. Servanthood, guys, when we walk in serving the Lord, we demonstrate that servant's heart first with our families. That servanthood acknowledges the lordship of Christ in our life. Watch very carefully now. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments and sat down again, he said to them, do you know what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. Now watch carefully. Jesus said, um, you call me your teacher. And then he says, and you call me Lord. 
And you have said that rightly. You're, you're correct in saying that. Now, I want you to watch this because in a moment he's going to flip it. And I don't want you to miss that. For them to say that Jesus was teacher was no big deal. There were lots of rabbis in that day. They were called teachers. Anybody could align themselves with a certain rabbi and they would be called that rabbi's disciple. That's why in the New Testament, you'll see that there were a lot of people confused about who Jesus was and some of them would come to him and they'd say, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher sent from God. What they were saying is, we know that you're one uh, of the rabbis. We, we've seen your giftedness in teaching. We believe that you're a great teacher. But if all you believe is that Jesus is a great teacher, you've really missed who he was because there were lots of rabbis in Jesus' day and lots of teachers who had disciples. And so Jesus says, yeah, you've called me to teach her. You came and followed me to be my disciples to learn my teachings. But you've learned along the way that I'm something far more than just a good teacher. You've learned that I'm the Lord. Jesus said, you came to understand that I'm not just the one teaching you the Torah, the law. That's what the rabbis did. And the understanding of the Old Testament law and prophets. He said, oh no, you've come to discover that I am the Lord, God enrobed in flesh. I'm the Messiah. I'm the one who has come to redeem you and I am God in flesh. And he said, so you call me Lord. Meaning you've surrendered your life to me and you understand that I'm over you. And he says, you know what? You've said that well. In other words, you're correct in doing that. But watch carefully now. In the very next verse, be careful how you read this. If I then your Lord and your teacher, did you notice he just swapped the order? <clears throat> Come on now, look at verse 13. This is, this is active participation here. Okay, so, so in 13 he said teacher because that's where they started. But they came to the conclusion he was Lord. And so now he flips it and he says, okay, if you call me your Lord, if I'm really the boss of your life, the master of who you are, then as your Lord, I'm teaching you how you ought to live. So watch then, if I then your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Jesus says, if I am your Lord, then you ought to do what I do and do what I say. Jesus says, if I can serve you, then you can serve others because you're acknowledging my Lordship over you. Now let's go back to the picture this great example. We talked last week about obedience required, right? And we, we talked a couple of weeks ago about, uh, you remember when humility was required, the guy would come in and he would put himself in the best seat and then he would get moved down. Y'all remember that? So, so here's the deal though. That same thing takes place here and yet Jesus is at the seat of honor. Now picture this. He's at the seat of honor. And nobody else at the table, including the ones at the lowest seat. And we talked about that a couple of weeks ago. The ones at the lowest seat were considered the lowest in the room. But nobody sitting at the table from the ones closest to the seat of honor to the furthest away wanted to humble themselves and admit that they should be servants and wash everybody's feet. Jesus was in the seat of honor. His feet should have been washed by somebody, but nobody wanted to say, I'm the lowest servant in the room and serve everybody else. So Jesus gets up out of the seat of honor. He takes his outer garment off, which is a sign of humility and humiliation. And he goes and he gets the pot and the water basin and he pours it in. And he begins to go down the line and wash their feet. I can imagine they watched in stunned, just, just don't even know what to do. And Jesus finishes, and he puts his clothes back on, and he goes back now. He's just, 
He's just said, I'm a servant. I should be at the lowest end of the table. And he goes back to the seat of honor. And here's his point. If I'm the Lord of the universe, and he is, and I can humble myself out of the seat of honor to serve you, then if you truly believe I'm your Lord, you ought to be able to humble yourself and serve me and serve others. Guys, we're talking a lot about how God wants us to be that servant leader in our home. And Jesus wanted to make sure that these men get it and he wants to make sure we get it. And listen to me. Because guys, if we're honest, we're like those guys sitting at the table. Now, y'all know how our male ego is. The guy sitting at the end of the table thought he should have been two or three seats ahead of where he was. I mean, remember they had a discussion along the way of who was the greatest. So you know whoever was sitting at the end of the table said, I ain't washing their feet. I am not the lowest one here. I know I'm ahead of him. (laughs) In our fallen nature, guys, we ascribe to a false philosophy that many men subscribe to. You may never say it this way, but your heart believes this sometimes in our sinful fallen nature. I'm the king of my castle. You may never say that to her. But in your heart, if your fallen nature is what is leading you, you believe that. And what does that mean? What we mean is that we're we're above everyone else in our home and that they're there to serve us. And yet, Jesus is just an example as the Lord of the universe that he came to serve In fact, the only one at that table who deserved to be served was Jesus. And Jesus himself said in the gospel, I did not come to be served, but to serve. And here's what Jesus is trying to tell us as men. If you want to call me Lord, then humble yourself and serve your family. Because I didn't put your family in your kingdom to serve you. I put you there to serve them. We don't like that. Now let's just be honest. Our fallen nature doesn't like that. That's why none of you men are amen in it right now. We don't like it. But if Jesus is Lord, we're supposed to represent Christ to our family. So let's move on to a second thing. Secondly, servanthood acknowledges the discipleship pattern of Christ. Look at verse 15. He says, for I've given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Guys, the Lord is going to die, rise again, and ascend back to the Father. And he's going to leave to the men in this room, minus Judas, who's going to betray him and die. He's going to leave to those men the process of winning and discipling the world. And so he teaches them the discipleship pattern. Now, they've been watching it all of their lives or the three years they've been with Jesus, but he wants to make sure they get it. He wants to make sure they understand everything that he's just done and the depth of it so that when he departs, they've got it. And he says, I I, I want you to understand something. I've given you an example now. That this is how you're to be a servant leader among those that you're going to disciple. And so I want to just walk through the pattern. The discipleship pattern of the Lord Jesus Christ is to first, number one, observe what Jesus does. Now they've sat there at this table and they've just watched him go down the line. He has disrobed himself. He has taken on the look of a servant, the lowest servant in the house. He's doing the dirtiest job in the house, and he's saying, I have no problem doing it, though I'm king of kings and lord of lords. And he says, okay, did you catch the picture? Though I am lord, though I'm the creator of the universe, I don't think that I am above serving people. 
And you need to watch. And I'm sure they sat there and they watched. <laughs> Blew their minds. Blew Peter's mind so bad, he said, Lord, you're not going to wash my feet. He said, well, if I don't wash you, you have no part in me. He said, then wash my head and everything. He said, no, you're already clean, meaning you're already saved. You just need a daily cleansing. But they had watched this grand example. And then he says, I've given you an example that you should do as I've done to you. He said, so here's the thing. Observe what Jesus does. Then we are to take that into our lives, and we're to do what Jesus does. They weren't just supposed to watch that example and then years from now talk about the time when Jesus washed my feet. Oh, no, 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 no. They'd watched the servant heart of Jesus and now they were supposed to take that heart of Jesus into their own heart and life and have that servant heart themselves so that they could then do the third thing. You see, we observe what Jesus does so that we can do what Jesus does so that we can then do the third part, and that is to teach others to do what Jesus does. That's the discipleship pattern of Jesus. He demonstrated it to his disciples through the three years of his ministry, three and a half, and, and, and then they were supposed to be watching and learning, and then he wanted them to start doing it. And then he wanted them to go, and that's why he says in the Great Commission, he says, now go make disciples of all peoples. You're to go and live it out in front of them and show them how to live what I did, lived in front of you. Now, guys, here's why that's important. When you and I live this life of servanthood that he's called us to, we're acknowledging that this discipleship pattern of Christ is right, and it's a part of who we are as men. Let me show you why. The first thing Jesus wants us as men to do is to observe what Jesus does. He wants us to learn for ourselves who Jesus is and how he lives and how he would have us to live. And so we're to observe when you come to church. Why are you here this morning? Are you here because it's, it's Sunday in the South? Or, or are you here so somebody will notice you being here and you'll get a check mark? Or are you here because, you know, you've got some uh, motivation other than Christ? Or are you here to have the Word of God open and observe Christ and how Christ would 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 do in certain situations and how he would live and what the truth of his word is see that's what we're supposed to be doing and then guys we're supposed to not just go oh that was a great story that'd be like these guys going yeah jesus washed my feet one time that was pretty cool <laughs> excuse me he didn't do it so you would think you were cool because jesus washed your feet he would do it because it would humble your heart and go man i'm not worth him washing my feet and if I'm not worth washing my feet, then who am I to refuse to wash someone else's feet? You, you get the picture? And Jesus then, guys, wants us to take that in our heart. Here's the reason, guys. Because we're supposed to disciple our families. So we're supposed to take Christ in for ourselves. We're to, we're to believe in him. He's to be our Savior and our Lord. And then we're to mimic him. We're to learn from him, and we're to follow in his step. And then when we've, we've learned it, we're to live it for ourselves. Because watch, you can't teach someone to do something that you yourself aren't willing to do. And so Jesus says, I, I want you now to do what I did. Because I want the world to see me in you so that they can learn to follow me. Guys, Jesus is telling us as the disciples of our home. He wants our hearts to align with his heart so that we can teach our families to do what Jesus does. One of the great problems with us as men is we don't want to be real serious about spiritual things. And we kind of, if we're honest, we want to leave that to our wives. But God didn't call her to be the spiritual leader in your home. She will help. She will certainly pour into your children. So what happens is a lot of men will adopt this kind of a philosophy where I'm not going to really observe Jesus very closely and I'm not going to really mimic him a lot in my life, but I'm going to teach my children to do it. You can't skip steps one and two and think that steps three will be successful in your home. 
Because there will come a time when your children, maybe when they get older, but they're going to say, well, Dad, if all of that's so important, why didn't you do it all those years? I mean, if this God stuff and this Jesus stuff is so important, Dad, why didn't you do it? This is the pattern. Now, guys, we're discipling our children, whether we intend to or not. Watch. The pattern still works. If you're not looking to see how Jesus does things and you replace that with how the culture or how the world or how your flesh does things, and then you begin to mimic that, whether you intentionally tell your children this is how you ought to live, they're learning by watching you. That's why Jesus says, listen, when you live out your life in this kind of servanthood that I'm calling you to, you're saying, acknowledging that this discipleship of pattern of Christ, not of self, not of culture, but this discipleship pattern of Christ is what I want for my wife and for my children. Thirdly, servanthood acknowledges our calling in Christ. When we serve, we're acknowledging that Christ has called us men. I know we think sometimes that calling is just for those in, in, you know, in the ministry or, or in, in missionaries and things like that. But guys, all of us are called. Notice what he says here in verse 16. He lays out three things that we as, as men, really all of us, but we as men are called to. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master. The first thing that we're called to in Christ is we're called to surrender. The Bible here, Jesus is speaking, he's already called himself Lord, and now he's calling us servants, and he says, you're not greater than your master. Well, Lord and master is the same thing. So when we surrender, the first thing we have to do is surrender our heart to Jesus as master. He's the master, we're not. Now, for us men, that's difficult, but what that means is that we give up the right to be the captain of our own ship. We give up the right to live life our own way, according to our own patterns. He's the master. So the very first calling we have in Christ is, Christ calls us to come and to die to self, to take up our cross and to follow him. The apostle Paul put it this way. He said, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Paul says, he's the master. Whatever good comes out of this life, it's him. Paul says, this life doesn't get to go and do whatever it wants to do. I did that in my old days when I lived in my sin under this, this curtain and this judgment of death. But now I've been born again. I've given my life to him. He's the master. Guys, this is important. See, God knows that we as men, we're stubborn. We talked about that last week, so just nod with me so you won't get the elbow in the ribs. We're stubborn, especially in our fallen nature. That's why we'll make excuses for our sin. But here's what we've got to come to. God knows that a man who is not surrendered to him will constantly fall back to himself. A man who's not surrendered to Christ will constantly fall back to himself. So our first calling in Christ is surrender. Notice the second calling. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant's not greater than his master. Our second calling, guys, is we're called to be servants. Jesus has just given this great demonstration of being a servant. And he says, I've set an example. I want you to do this. I want you to be a servant. We as men have to come to the point where we go. We are called of Christ to be servants to our family. We're to be obedient and serve others for the glory of Christ.
God has called us as men to be servant leaders in our home, in our church, and in our community. That's how God calls for the world to be changed through the growth of the gospel. One heart, one family, one community at a time. If we as men do our task of being servants, we'll make a profound difference. Isn't it amazing that those 11 men minus Judas, 12 minus Judas, it makes 11 men, that they caught the vision of this message. And after the resurrection of Christ, they sought to be the servants of God that he called them to be. And from those 11 men to the 120 who were in the upper room, they led as servant leaders of movement that swept across Jerusalem and Asia Minor. And today has swept all across the world to the tune of over a billion people who claim to be followers of Christ because of the servant leadership of those men. What would happen if we had a revival of men who decided that they were called to be servants who looked like the Lord they professed? Thirdly, in this act of servanthood that acknowledges our calling in Christ, there's a third calling. We're called to be surrendered. We're called to be servants. But watch this. We are sent. Verse 16, he continues. He says, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. Guys, you're sent. I know we always think of sent as, you know, those missionaries, they've been sent. You know, maybe these pastors, they've been sent. Guys, all of us have been sent. Now, we touched on this last week a little bit. We talked about obedience required. Guys, the Lord Jesus Christ in his sovereignty sent you to your family. Stop and think about that a moment. God sent you to be the servant leader to your family. I know you want to say you chose her and this, that, and the other. Trust me, there's nothing about us that calls her to want us except God. The Lord put us together. Hear me. God sent you. God sent you to your family. Whether you like it or not, he did. You see, in this heart of being a servant, we recognize that God sent me to love this woman in Jesus' name. God sent me to love these children in Jesus' name. God sent me to be a servant leader to reflect Christ in my life before them so that they will choose to follow Christ and do the same. Guys, I want to go a step further. God not only sent you to be a servant leader in your home, but he sent you to be a servant leader in this church. He sent you to be a servant leader in this community. I want to go a step further. You see... The sending, the calling of God, the sending of you is not just to the place, but it's also the time and the season. Let me tell you what I mean. Can we all admit that these are difficult days? Can we all agree on that? These are difficult days. But do you know what's so interesting? As difficult as these days are, guys, God not only sent you to the place of servant leadership in your home and your church and your community, but he sent you at the time. He chose us guys to be servant leaders at exactly this time in history. Why is that important? Because your children and grandchildren, they're, they're scared, they're worried, they're confused. Why aren't we going back to school, Mommy? What's going on, Mommy? Is daddy going to lose his job, mommy? How are we going to eat, mom? Dad, how are we going to make it? Everybody seems so sad, dad. Everybody seems so angry. Nobody seems to be happy. 
Dad, I'm scared. And God put me and you as spiritual leaders at just this time in the life of our families. And guys, now's the time to teach our children that we trust the Lord no matter what. That he is faithful whether things ever get back to normal or not. That he is to be worshipped and adored and followed regardless of how hard life gets on our behalf. Can't you could be the dad or the granddad that a generation from now when they start to go through hard times they'll say, you know my dad's dad taught him back in that Pandemic time when everything was going crazy. Son, we trust God because he loves us no matter what. For just this time, God puts you in that place to live out Christ in front of them. Fourthly and finally, I want you to notice that servanthood acknowledges the truth of the teachings of Christ. When we live out in obedience this calling to servanthood, we're acknowledging that the teachings of Christ are truth. We believe them and that they're true. Look at verse 17. Jesus closes out this conversation of teaching his disciples what that whole thing with the foot washing was about. And he says, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. So notice what Jesus says here. Knowledge plus obedience equals blessings. Knowledge plus obedience equals blessing. Now why do you think Jesus wanted to, to teach the disciples that? Because he knows us men. Most of us would be satisfied to be able to tell you what Jesus said. Knowledge. But Jesus says that's not enough. You've got to know it and do it. Observe what I do, then do what I do. Right? So knowledge plus obedience equals blessings. So we're to know the truth of the teachings of Christ. Men, that's why we have to be men of the word. That's why we have to be in the word every day, letting the teachings of Christ speak to our life. Secondly, we then must put the teachings of Christ into action in our lives. We've got to quit saying, I know that God said this, but I feel, I think, I will. We've got to stop that. We've got to start to adopt this mentality of a servant. My master said, therefore I will do. My Lord said, therefore I will do. You see the difference? And Jesus is telling us exactly what James taught us. James said we shouldn't just be hearers of the word, but we should be doers. And then Jesus says, if you'll do that, if you know and do the things I've taught you, then you will be blessed. Now, let me just stop here for a moment. This is not like our world talks about blessed. You know, somebody gets the new dream car they've been wanting and they put a sticker on there, hashtag blessed. Or my favorite is when they get the sports car of their dream and they get the license plate and it says blessed. So what? The guy that didn't get that isn't blessed? Hello? See, that's such an American idea. See, right now, because of the way life is so difficult and we're feeling pressured, we don't feel very blessed right now. Ladies and gentlemen, I hate to tell you this, but the church and the other parts of the world that have been being persecuted for centuries are looking at us and going, you've got to be kidding. You've still got it far better than we do. So are they not blessed because they've lived in persecution for all these years? As followers of Christ, are they not blessed? Let me just go ahead and answer the question for you. They're absolutely blessed. Let me show you why. Jesus says... If you know my teachings and you do them, you're blessed. The Greek word there for blessed is makarios. It means happy. It means to be marked by happiness. And here's what he's saying. He's saying if you as believers in Christ know the word of the Lord and are living it, 
you'll be happy. Watch now. He didn't say anything about our circumstances, did he? He didn't add anything else into the equation. He didn't say knowledge plus obedience plus a great lifestyle. He didn't say knowledge plus obedience plus no pandemic. He didn't say knowledge plus obedience plus secure job. He didn't say knowledge plus obedience plus a large 401k. He didn't say any of that. He said knowledge plus obedience equals happiness. Why? Here's the point. As a child of God, the only way we can be happy is to live in obedience to the truth of the Word of God. Now, if you're a believer and you're not living in obedience to the truth of the Word of God, the Holy Spirit of God will never allow you to be happy even if you have all those other things. That's why so many who want to pursue what we call the American dream but are really born again, we've exchanged the truth for a lie, and we thought happiness was found in all that stuff. And we got some of that stuff, and then we weren't satisfied because we didn't have it as good as the guy above us had it. You're never going to be happy living outside of God's will for your life because as a child of God, the Spirit of God will not let you be happy in rebellion. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that if we are living outside of God's word and will for our life, he says you'll be miserable because the Spirit of God will discipline. The word is chasten. That means he's going to take you to the woodshed. That's not a fun, happy place. In case y'all don't know. Maybe y'all didn't grow up getting weapons. <laughs> That's not fun. But it also says if you can live in disobedience and you never go to the woodshed and you're happy in your sin, you're not born again. So what Jesus has just taught us, men, is we're truly born again. The only way we can be happy is to live the life God created us to live. And the life that he created us to live is to live saved under the lordship of Christ and serving him. And you know what? Jesus says, if you know my teachings and do them, you will be blessed. Guys, we've got to start putting, stop putting other things into the equation that God never put in the equation. Knowledge plus obedience equals blessed. Don't exchange God's happiness in your life for something else. Service is required, guys. He's called us to be the servant leaders of our home. Would you bow your head with me? Father, God, I pray today if there's anyone in the sound of my voice, both here in the auditorium or by way of the internet, Lord God, I pray that you would grab their heart right now. And God, I pray that they would right now give their heart and life to Christ before it's too late. Lord, I pray that we as men, God, that we would hear your word. Service is required. And we, Lord, would demonstrate servanthood in our life to the glory of Christ. Lord, I pray that we would surrender ourselves to you right now in what you have for us. I pray, God, that we wouldn't leave this place today until we've done business with you. Right now, Lord, I pray that you would be glorified and honored. In Jesus' name, amen. Friend, if you need Christ as your Savior and your Lord today, there's going to be pastors at the back door waiting to share with you from the Word of God. Friend, I want to thank you for joining us today for worship at Hopewell Baptist Church. And perhaps today, during this message, God spoke to your heart, and you would think to yourself right now, Scott, I, I really would like to have a relationship with this God that you've talked about. I want to know that my sins are forgiven, and that this Jesus that you've talked about today is my Lord and my Savior. Well, friend, you can. The Bible says very clearly, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Bible says if you'll confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Friend, I want to lead us in a time of prayer right now. You can repeat these words after me. There's nothing magical about the words that I'm about to speak. 
They simply have to be the cry of your heart to God. And God is listening and will hear your words and will forgive your sins and to save your soul. Would you just right there where you are, repeat this prayer with me if that's what God's speaking to your heart right now. You just pray something like this. Dear God, I am so sorry. I know that I have rebelled against you and lived life my own way and not cared about you or your authority over my life. I know your word calls that sin, and I am so sorry. God, I ask you right now to forgive me of my sins and to save my soul based on what your son Jesus Christ did for me by taking my punishment on the cross and by rising again three days later to seal my victory. Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for taking my punishment on the cross. Thank you for rising again to seal my victory. And Lord, right now, as best I know how, I give you my life to live for you all the days that I have left. In Jesus' name, amen. Friend, if you prayed that prayer right there, I want you to know that God has forgiven you. He has saved you. The Bible says He has written your name down in the Lamb's book of life. He has adopted you into His family. And right now, I want you to share that good news with us so that we can rejoice with you and encourage you in your newfound journey of faith. Right now, if you are watching me, there is in this corner, uh, there is a QR code. If you would take your phone and put the camera up to it, it's going to open up a dialog box. And if you would just fill that out and send it in, when you do, it goes to our pastors and they will respond back to you. Please give us your email phone number so that we can get back in touch with you. If you happen to be watching on our website, this dialog box is just beneath me here if you'll scroll down and fill that out. And so if you happen to be on YouTube on your phone right now and say, well, I, I can't take a picture with my phone, if you will just open up the information box below that, the description box, there's a link there that you can click. Once you click that, it's going to open the same dialog box. When it does, it gives you three choices. The first one says, today I prayed to receive Christ saved. That's what you did. Would you check that box and then fill out the information? Maybe you join us today and you'd say, Scott, I'm a believer. I've given my heart and life to Christ, but I've got some things I need help with or encouragement with. I need you to pray with me about some stuff, or I have some spiritual or physical needs that I need the church to help me with. You can do the same thing when that dialog box opens up. There's two other boxes that you could check. One says prayer request. One says needs. You check the appropriate box. Give us the information. And again, our pastors will be back in touch with you. Friend, again, thank you so much for joining us today in worship. We at Hopewell, we love you. We're praying for you. And we hope to see you here live on campus with us one day real soon. God bless now.